Saturday University is sponsored by University of Wyoming, the University of Wyoming Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and UW Outreach School. The program is presented locally by Sheridan College. Our first speaker is our hometown speaker. It's Rachel Christensen from the Psych Department at Sheridan College. She was born and raised in Sheridan. She got her B. Um, her bachelor's degree in psychobiology at Southampton College of Long Island University. She went on to get her master's of science and her PhD in experimental psychology at the University of Southern Mississippi. Her research is in animal behavioral processes and when she was an undergrad and starting in graduate school her work focused on dolphins and humpback whales which took her to the Gulf of Mexico and to Australia to do her research. I found out that there were some fun funding crises which brought her back to the United States where she got to work on the, the very interesting topic of horses and horse personality. So this morning she's going to talk to us about the thinking animal, a look at comparative psychology in the 21st century. Please welcome Rachel Christensen. Okay, thank you Peter. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So I am a comparative psychologist. My degree is in experimental psychology. Um, and for those of you who have never heard of comparative psychology, don't feel bad. Most people have not. Um, people usually think of psychologists as people who you know, counsel other people or diagnose mental disorders. And a lot of psychologists do. Um, I am not that person. So a lot of people do come to me and ask me to analyze them. And <laughs> I make stuff up because it makes them feel better. But I really, I, I can analyze the animal mind much better than the human mind. It's, it's much more simple and less dramatic. <laughs> um, but today I would like to introduce you to this field of comparative psychology that I do love so much. So first we're going to talk about why do we study animals in the first place. Well, there's three main reasons that we could look at. And the first is just sheer curiosity, okay? I'm sure every one of you has at some point asked yourself, why is that animal behaving in a certain way? Especially if you have a pet, right? You want to know why does my dog chase its tail, okay? And a lot of times you're wondering, what is that animal really thinking? You know, does my, does my animal have a sense of self? You know, what, what is he thinking? Well, I'm gone all day long. What is my animal sitting around doing with its day? Okay? Um, and another huge thing that comparative psychologists are always wanting to know is what makes humans different from other animals? Okay? We're constantly wondering, you know, as if you think about all the thousands of species that exist on this planet, humans are the ones that have developed technology and medicine and weapons and all of these things that put us in power over all the other species on Earth. So what is it about humans that has made us so different from the other animals and how close are those an other animals to us in their ability to think and reason? <laughs> so the second reason is for animal conservation and animal welfare. So with all of the human development that's going along, that's coming around, um, we're losing a lot of our wildlife habitat. And animals every year are going extinct, okay? You know, dozens of species every year. Sometimes it's a minor species that doesn't get any recognition. Sometimes it's a large species like the black rhino or the Chinese river dolphin. And now those animals are gone, never to return. And so a lot of zoos and animal welfare organizations are very... Uh, desperate to establish and maintain some captive breeding programs so that even if an animal goes extinct in the wild, at least it's still alive somewhere, even if it's in a zoo. So they're trying to establish all these different uh, breeding programs. And for a while, like back in the 1970s and 1980s, with some species they were having a lot of problems. For example, with the cheetahs. They would put their males in the, their male cheetahs and female cheetahs in an exhibit and they would wait for something to happen and the cheetahs were not breeding and everyone was baffled. They were you know, frustrated and upset because they wanted to be able to breed these cheetahs. And finally, in 1994, a group of researchers that were doing field studies in Africa published some of their findings on their observational research. And it turns out, well, female cheetahs live and hunt alone. The only time they seek out male company is when they're in estrus, which is just a few days every month, okay? Other than that, they want nothing to do with other cheetahs, okay? So the zoos got hold of this information. They separated the males and females for pretty much the whole time unless the females were in estrus. And almost immediately, you turn around. You put the females in with the males when they want to be with them. And now we have little baby cub cheetahs running around all over zoos all over the world. Okay? So something very simple, just understanding what animals do in the wild if we want to apply this to our ability to conserve them and to do what's best for the individual animal. All right? 
And then finally, a third reason that we like to study animals is for human medical advancement. Okay? Now, some people have ethical issues with this. It's a big controversy. But if you're going to use an animal model for medical research, you need to understand the behavior. Okay? This particular mouse, for example, has been genetically engineered so that he will develop the neurological symptoms of Alzheimer's disease so that we can study treatments and possible cures for Alzheimer's disease. Okay? Before we know, before we can do anything with this mouse, though, we have to understand what normal behavior in a mouse is. How do I know it has memory loss or abnormal behavior if I don't first know what is normal behavior for a mouse? Okay, so part of the reason that we study just animal behavior, even in something as simple as a mouse, is so we know what is abnormal behavior if we want to do any kind of medical research. All right, so to introduce comparative psychology, First and foremost, it is the study of animal behavior, okay? But there is an underlying purpose to comparative psychology, which is basically to discover underlying principles, underlying general principles that we can apply to all animal species, including humans, okay? And when we are looking at comparative psychology, and we're looking at a behavior in an animal, there are four main questions that we want to ask. And these questions were developed by a man named Nico Tinbergen, he was an ecologist in the 1950s when he published this, and he actually won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1973 for his work in this area. Okay? So he gave us a lot of information for this. All right, so the four questions are how did the behavior evolve, uh, why does the behavior exist, how did the behavior develop, and what causes the behavior. All right, so if we look at an example. Let's say that it's dawn, and outside your window there is this lovely male songbird, and he's just singing his song away, <laughs> waking you up. Okay? So your question is, why is that bird singing? Okay? You ask it with a little more exasperation and maybe a few more curse words thrown in there. Okay? But essentially, you're asking the question, why is the bird singing? Okay? But just asking that question alone is not going to give me enough information to answer you, because I don't know what question you're really asking. There's four possible answers here. Okay, if you're asking me, why is the bird singing? Well, I could explain it in terms of how that behavior evolved. Okay, well, over thousands of years, bird song has developed through genetic mutations, and the birds have split off from each other, they've developed new species, okay, and bird song has developed from there. Okay, so I could explain it in terms of evolution. Um, if we look at why does the behavior exist, this is looking at the purpose or the function of the song. So I could explain to you, well, the bird is probably maintaining territory because male songbirds use their song to talk to other male rivals and defend their territory. He's also trying to attract a mate, okay? trying to show all the females, look how strong and complex my song is. Okay? So in this case, the behavior is the mechanism for survival and reproduction. Okay? And so these first two questions we call ultimate explanations because they deal with how the species has survived over time. All right? Now these bottom two are more located to just the individual. Okay? If you're asking why is the bird singing, well I could explain it in terms of how it has developed. Okay? This young songbird when he was born, he has the genes to instinctively start to sing. Okay? But that song's not going to make any sense until he listens to other males of his species and he starts to mimic that song and practice that song until it becomes his species' typical song that will actually attract a mate. Okay, so we can look at it in terms of development. And then finally, we could just simply look at it of what is causing the behavior, meaning what is the physical cause? What is the pathway in the brain that is connecting to the vocal cords of the bird and connecting to the mouth of the bird to physically produce sound? Okay? So these are the four main questions that we can ask of any one given behavior. So when you ask a simple question of why is the bird singing, it's actually a very complex answer. <laughs> okay? So there's four possible answers I can give you for this. So anytime a comparative psychologist is studying even something very, what seems very simple, it's actually a very complex answer that we have to do lots of study on. Okay. So just a brief history of early comparative psychology because you know, we say that it's a really new field, but it's actually not. Even when psychology was first getting started and established as a scientific field, comparative psychology was there. We were studying animals from the very beginning. And so it's actually based on the work of the British naturalists, such as Charles Darwin and Lloyd Morgan. Okay, and they were doing all their work on looking at how does a behavior survive? How does it allow an animal to adapt to its changing environment? Okay? And the comparative psychologists kind of latched onto this idea and took off with it. Okay? It was established really as a sustainable science in the 1930s and has grown from there. All right? 
Now, this fundamental issue in psychology, and you still have this division between comparative psychologists. You have the comparative psychologists that study animal behavior purely because they are interested in what animals are doing and what animals are thinking. And it kind of goes back to that curiosity issue that we talked about, um, or the conservation issue. And then you have the comparative psychologists that want to study animals in order to do that comparison of animals and humans, okay? Why are humans superior to animals? Or are humans superior to animals, okay? So this is the fundamental divide that we still have today in comparative psychology. And you can look at it from either way. Either side has to defend their choice to the other side, and that's kind of the debate among the scientists. All right. Now, early comparative psychology, even back in the 1930s, was heavily criticized, and that has brought about some changes um, in today's science that I'm going to share with you. So, for example, animals back in the 1930s had no protection from experimentation. Okay? There, were, there was no special committees that you had to get approval from. Animals were subjected to painful experiments, vivisection, unnecessary death, okay? and that was a very large criticism of the researchers of that time. Okay? Um, a lot of the researchers were performing experiments and publishing their findings without comparing that captive animal to what they would be behaving as in the wild. Okay? And again, you know, if you look at the cheetah example, that can be a huge issue. You know, you're studying behavior of these captive animals, but if you don't look at how they behave in the wild, you're not really that sure that you're getting an accurate idea of what that behavior is. Okay, um, and then finally, a lot of scientists were relying simply on anecdotal evidence. They weren't doing controlled experiments. They were watching an animal and publishing essentially a story on what they observed. Okay, and that does not make psychology a science at all. We're an empirical science. We have to do controlled experiments. Okay, so all of that put the field under fire, legitimately. And at the end of the 20th century, there was a huge turnaround where these psychologists in comparative psychology were really trying to show, no, we are a legitimate field, and we will fix all these issues that we are having. All right, so that is bringing us to modern comparative psychology. So now we're in the 21st century, and really what we've done with comparative psychology is we've taken these studies of evolution, and we've taken ecology, you know, looking at the natural behavior of the animal, and we have added that to the psychological study of behavior and mental processes. All right, so I'll give you another example. This is called the Clark's Nutcracker, okay? It's a bird that's found in North America, and this is one of the, it's not necessarily one of the most intelligent species, but it has one of the best memories of any animal that you will ever meet, okay? So every given year, this bird has to start storing food for the winter, okay? Just kind of like a squirrel, okay? And it does so by creating what we call caches, so they're little storage areas of seeds, okay? Every year, it will store between 22,000 and 33,000 seeds in 7,000 different cache sites, <laughs> okay? And of those 7,000 sites, it will remember where about 80% of them are, from what we can tell, and it will visit them in the order that it created them so that it consumes the seeds it buries first before they go bad. Okay? I can't even do that in my refrigerator. <laughs> All right, so this bird has an amazing memory. So researchers have been, you know, they observe this bird, they look at it, and, you know, it's really hard to monitor 7,000 cache sites. So we say, okay, we think that they retrieved about 80% of the sites, but again, we can't monitor them 24-7, so it's possible that they got more, okay? So we can do kind of a mini experiment. We can't set up 7,000 cache sites, but we can get these birds, and we can set them up in an experimental room, and we can give them 180 sites to cache. So within this room, Buried on the floor are these different 180 little holes that are filled with sand, okay? And so they take the bird in there, they give them a pile of seeds, and they give the bird the opportunity to start going and caching the seeds in different places, okay? So it does that for a day. They take the bird out of the room, and then a week later, they bring it back into the room, okay? And they find pretty much similar findings to the wild studies. Um, the bird only went to the little holes that it actually made a cache in. It ignored the others, okay? And it retrieved 85% of the seeds that it buried. Okay, so this is how, you know, we look at it from an ecological perspective, we've studied it in the wild, and now we try to do an experiment in the psychological laboratory to see if we see the same results. Okay, so this is basically what a comparative psychologist does, and why I think it's so much more fascinating than studying people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to talk about just a few little topics in comparative psychology, and when, when I first um, got the email from Amy and she invited me to come, I was like, oh, I'll talk about comparative psychology and I can talk about all these different things. 
And then I realized, oh, if I talked about everything I'd like to share, we'd be here for like four hours. And then she said, well, you have 45 minutes. So I've had to narrow down uh, what I would like to share with you. So I just have a few examples and a few different species that I'd like to share with you. Um, and today we're going to start with talking about perception. And this is basically how animals take sensory information from their world and make sense of it, okay? And this is how we can look at where is the difference now between animals and humans. Like if I'm looking at something in my house and my dog is also looking at it, are we really seeing the same thing, okay? Or are we perceiving something different? Okay, this is one of those questions that all people ask of themselves, okay? So if we look at perception, um, you have to understand that perception is different than what we call sensation, okay? Sensation is just when your brain gets all of that sensory input through the senses, whether it be sight or hearing, touch, any of your senses, okay? But perception is when your brain takes that information, it organizes it, and it interprets it. Okay? This is the reason that you and your friend can be looking at the same object and you'll sit there and argue over the color. Okay? One of you sees that it's blue, the other one sees that it's purple. And you both think the other person is insane because it's very clearly blue or purple. Okay? So this is because even though you're receiving the same sensory information, you're both getting that same sensation through your eyes, your brain is interpreting it differently. Okay? Usually based on past experiences, okay? but there's also differences in the amount of certain cones that you have within your eyes. Okay? So, there's a lot of different senses that we could study, and there's a lot of different techniques that comparative psychologists use to study them. We don't have time to cover them all today, okay? So, but for our example, I want to look at color vision in animals because color vision in all mammals that are different than humans is a little bit different, and our, our sample species is going to be the dolphin. Okay, so I'm going to show you this graph, and you're probably all familiar with the visible spectrum of light, okay? Humans can see between 400 and 700 nanometers, okay? So if we're looking at wavelength, 400 is like the, the violet colors of the rainbow, right? And then we go up to 700 nanometers, which is in the red zone, okay? So anything below 400 is considered ultraviolet light, okay? Um, insects can see ultraviolet, some birds can see ultraviolet, humans cannot. And then infrared is anything above 700 nanometers. And some species like snakes use infrared light to see with their tongues, okay, because it's more of a heat light. All right, and then if you're looking at this white light, this white line, excuse me, this is showing in the dolphin retina how well they respond to different wavelengths of light, okay? So we can see here, oops, sorry. Okay, so at 490 nanometers, the dolphin retina has what we call maximum photopic sensitivity, meaning if you, show the, if you shine that wavelength at the dolphin retina, it's going to respond very well. Okay, so the higher it is on this graph, the better the response. Okay, you can also see that dolphins have another maximum in the near UV, so we're pretty sure that dolphins can actually see UV light. Okay, still need to do some more experiments, we're not totally sure. It's hard to experiment on this when humans can't see what we're testing on, okay? So it makes it, makes it tricky, all right? But unlike humans, dolphins only have these two peaks. They have peaks in the short wavelengths. They have peaks in the medium wavelengths. But you can see after 524 nanometers, we have a drastic drop-off, okay? Dolphins can't see oranges and reds like we do, okay? In fact, most mammals cannot. They don't have what we call the long wavelength cones in their eye. Okay? And this is important to remember when we're doing you know, different learning tasks. If you're testing animals on, on objects that are red and you put them against like a yellow background and you say, oh, the animal doesn't understand, they can't learn the task, it's not that the animal can't learn, it's that they can't see. Okay? So as humans, we have to understand what it is that the animal is actually perceiving. Okay? So we know from tests that the dolphins can discriminate between 397 and 487 nanometers. Okay? You can kind of see those are both around the same, the peaks that they can see. Okay? But then if you start looking, if you go down into the blues and the greens, a dolphin can't discriminate between these two colors. Okay? So between 457 and 544, the color essentially looks the exact same to them. Okay? So how do we test this? Well, we get to do a fun little learning task with the dolphin, okay? So we do what's called a match to sample task, okay? Um, fairly simple test. It's very easy to train an animal to do this. You can train a pigeon to do this, okay? So it's not that the dolphin is crazy smart. We can do this with almost any animal, all right? But basically the idea is the dolphin targets the top, the top image, okay? Or whatever the top stimulus is. Okay, so it's supposed to target that, and then it's given two options underneath that, and its job is to touch its rostrum to the one that matches the top. 
Okay, so the dolphin learns, pick the one that matches and I'll get a fish. Okay, so um, this is looking at it using shapes, but if we wanted to do it using colors, we would just substitute colored shapes for the actual shapes. Okay, so you could give it, you know, a purple one on top and then your choices are purple or green and see if it can match it. Okay, now if it consistently chooses the correct match each time, that pretty much tells us, okay, it can tell the difference between these two colors. If it is kind of a 50-50 shot where it sometimes, half the time it picks the correct one, half the times it picks the wrong one, well, that tells us that that dolphin cannot tell the difference between those two colors, okay? And so that's kind of how we determine what the dolphin is actually perceiving, okay? Now you have to control for certain things like brightness, okay? Think about it if you were to put these colors on gray scale, okay? The dolphin's gonna be able to tell the difference between light gray and dark gray. So you have to control for brightness with your colors, okay? That's another error that we have had in the past, all right? Um, and then you have to always remember that just because it can tell a difference does not mean that it's perceiving the same colors we are, okay? We might see it as purple and green, it might see it as light purple and you know, dark blue or something like that. We don't know what the dolphin is perceiving, just that it perceives that the two colors are different. Okay? So that's how we could test that behaviorally and look to see what the dolphin is actually perceiving. And we do this with different types of tests with all kinds of different animals. Okay? You can do different sounds, frequencies, you can do different senses of touch. We can play around with this all day long. All right, so that was a good example of, of a learning task, okay? It's the basic discrimination, match to sample. Um, but because I love learning so much, I want to give you another example and delve a little bit deeper into learning in animals. All right, so before we look at what animals can learn, first I want to make sure that we understand there is a purpose to learning, okay? Why animals learn at all. We have this behavioral flexibility because the ability to learn is essentially equivalent to the ability to adapt. Meaning when you live in a changing environment, whether it is that the seasons are changing, or your predators are migratory, or your prey is migratory, okay, you have to be able to learn based on previous experiences. Okay? So it's very important that the brain has this ability to change and be flexible. All right, now there's lots of different types of learning that we don't have time to cover all of them, but basically you have associative learning, which is your classical conditioning. Um, you may have heard of Pavlov's dogs, the dogs that learn to drool in response to a bell. Okay, it's kind of a classical example that we give in psychology. Um, there's habituation learning, where you habituate to your surroundings. Recognition learning, like imprinting, when ducklings, you know, the first living thing that they see, that becomes mom. Doesn't matter if it's an actual duck or not. Okay, um, there's social learning where an animal learns just by observing its peers or its family members. Okay, but today I'm going to give you an example of what's called categorization learning. So in our example, um, this is an example that's done at the Equine Research Center in California. And basically this horse has been taught to find what doesn't belong. You know, remember that rhyming song where it's which of these does not belong with the others or something like that, okay? Well, this horse has been taught to do that. He's been taught that whatever this center object is, is what I'm supposed to look at. And then I look at all the other stimuli around it and I'm supposed to select the one that doesn't belong in its category, okay? And in this case, the category is filled objects versus open objects, okay? So even though these are all different shapes, okay, he has learned that, okay, the category is things that are filled in. And if I want to get my carrot or whatever the reward is, I have to select the shape with my nose that is open. All right, and so that's what he has done here. All right, basic categorization learning. Okay, now this is actually fairly complex. You know, we look at this and be like, oh, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, you know, human children could struggle with this at a very early age. Okay, so think about all of the things that this horse has had to learn. First, he's had to learn which one he has to pay attention to. Right, the center object is is my control stimulus that I'm comparing everything to. Okay. Then he has to learn, okay, I have to compare it to everything else that I see, okay? Then he has to have learned what a category is and what this category is, because it could be size, it could be shape, okay? It could be filled or open. It could be all kinds of different categories. And then he has to select the one that's not in that category, okay? So it's actually pretty impressive for a species that we used to think was as dumb as a sheep or a cow, okay? And we're starting to learn that horses are actually extremely intelligent. Um, and I'll give another example of, of some errors that we've had in previous experiments here. All right, so how do we get to this point? Well, this kind of takes us into this idea also of what's called concept learning, okay? This horse has learned the concept 
of selecting filled versus open. Okay, so we train this by starting the horse out just on giving it two stimuli at once. Okay, so in a learning task, he would be given a closed circle and an open circle. Okay, and he would learn that I get rewarded when I touch my nose to the closed circle. Okay, he gets that down, we give him another pair. We give him a filled square versus an open square, and he learns if I touch the filled square, I get, I get a treat, okay? I have to ignore the open square. And he'll do this with all sorts of pairs. There'll probably be like 16 different pairs of shapes that are filled and open in this whole learning set, okay? And then after we're sure that the horse seems to understand these pairs and he's learned them, we give him some novel shapes, okay? He's never seen them before, okay? So we've got like, you know, a heart, a lightning bolt, whatever it may be, okay? He's never seen them before, but we want to know what he will choose. So we give him a, a closed heart and an open heart. And sure enough, the horse goes and he touches his nose to the closed heart, okay? This shows us that the horse has learned the concept, okay? He has learned closed means reward, open means no reward. And it doesn't matter what the shape is, because I've never learned this particular shape pair, okay? But I've learned the concept of I select the one that doesn't have an opening in the middle, okay? And then once we've learned the concept, we move on to, okay, well now let's see if you understand what a category is, okay? So these are all experiments that are going on at the Equine Research Center, um, lots of really interesting things. And I had mentioned, you know, in the past we've thought that horses were fairly unintelligent. And this goes back to, again, humans not understanding different perceptions of horses. So a lot of, some of the first discrimination tests that we ever did was color discrimination, okay? So they show the horses, you know, purple and blue and said, okay, tell us which one is different. <laughs> and the horse couldn't do it because he doesn't have the sensory receptors to be able to tell the difference between blue and purple. So they published all these findings. Oh, horses can't learn basic discrimination. A rat can learn this, but a horse cannot. Horses are stupid, okay? And then finally, a comparative psychologist came in and said, well, <laughs> it's not that they're stupid, it's that they cannot see the difference. You have to test them with appropriate stimuli for that species. And so we have gone, grown in leaps and bounds in this and being able to ensure that the animals can understand what the differences are between the stimuli. All right, so switching gears a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about how um, animals communicate. Because um, communication, and I'm not talking about the ability to speak, okay? We're not going to talk about chimpanzees that can use sign language, although that is interesting in its own right. I could spend three hours on that, okay? But I want to talk about just basic animal communication when they're communicating with their own species, when they're communicating with different species, okay? So when we're looking at communication, there's three main ways it can happen. You have vocal communication, okay, where they're actually making some kind of vocalization. You have body language, okay, your dog uses this a lot, right? Wags his tail when he wants to play, he puts his front half down, the other half's up in the air, it's called a play bow, okay? Bodily communication. And then there's scent communication, okay? They leave their scent behind in some way to show, this is my territory. All right, so those are the three main ways. But either way, there's two main parts to communication, okay? The first is that whoever is sending the communication is intending for a certain recipient, okay? So the communication is intentional, okay? And then the second key thing to communication is that the idea is it's going to benefit both parties, okay? You don't want to communicate with someone that's going to harm you, okay? So I'll give you an example. We've got a male white crowned sparrow here in this picture, and he's singing his territorial song, okay? This could be the bird outside your window at dawn. All right, so he's singing a song, and he has two possible intended recipients, okay? The first might be other rival males in the area, okay? We consider this true communication because he's intending for the males to hear him, and he's hoping that the response is going to benefit both of them. The idea is he sings the song, says, this is my territory, please stay away, because if we have to fight, somebody's going to get injured, okay? Even if I'm bigger than you, I'm still going to have to spend all this energy and time fighting you out of my territory when I could be mating with something or eating something, okay? So the idea is that the response will benefit both parties. Nobody gets hurt. Everybody gets to do what they want to do, all right? Now, another true communication is that he's intending to communicate could be to females of his species, right? He's saying, look how complex and strong my song is. Ignore all the other males in the area and come mate with me, okay? Because the female birds of these species, they have it easy. They get to sit in the tree and they listen to all the males in the area and they pick who has the strongest and most complex song, okay? So they get to choose based on that. So that's what he's hoping is going to happen here, right? He's defending his territory and attracting a mate. So we consider these examples true communication because it fits both things. Now, at the same time, when the bird is singing, lots of other species are going to hear what's going on, right? You've got, you know, other species that are doing their thing. 
in the forest, whether they're eating or foraging or mating or whatever it is, and they're just going to ignore this bird. They don't really don't care what he's doing, okay? This is not true communication because the sparrow is not intending for anybody to, for anybody else to hear him, okay? And it's not benefiting anybody, okay? So it's not true communication. It just happens to be occurring because that's how sound works, okay? And now the other type of, commu of, of overhearing that can happen which is not true communication, is that this sparrow is running the risk when he's singing his nice, big, strong, territorial song, he's also letting every predator in the area know where he is, okay? So he kind of runs the risk of, I got to defend my territory, I got to attract a mate, I might be eaten by a hawk, okay? So we don't consider this true communication because he's certainly not intending for the predator to overhear him, and whatever the hawk's response is, is certainly not going to benefit him. Okay, so it's not true communication. The hawk just happens to be what we call eavesdropping. Okay, and that's really literally what we call it in animal communication. All right, so um, bird song itself is actually very complex. Um, they have a whole matching and competition uh, structure to their songs. That's actually pretty interesting. Um, but I want to give another example of a complex communication in a different species because I've talked about birds enough. Um, this is a vervet monkey, okay? And vervet monkeys live in what we call troops, so they're pretty large groups of monkeys, between 30 and 40 animals usually. And back in the 1970s and 1980s, researchers started to get this idea that every time there was a predator in the area, the monkeys had a specific call for different predators, okay? And so they started recording these calls and they started looking at the behavior, and it seemed that the monkeys had three main predators. You have leopards, eagles, and snakes, okay? And every time one of these predators came in, one, whatever monkey saw at first would call out an alarm call, okay? And then all the monkeys would respond in kind depending on what the predator was, okay? And so what they would find is that if a monkey let out a call that was specific to a leopard, okay, all the monkeys would, would immediately look up and they'd run up into the trees. They'd get as high up in the trees as they can, okay, if they heard a leopard call. If they hear an eagle call, all the monkeys would run down from the trees, or if they were already on the ground, they would dive into the bushes, they would find a hollow log, and they would all hide, okay, because there's an eagle flying around. If it was a snake call, they would all stand up on their hind legs and get as tall as they could and look down in the grass and try to find the snake, okay? But when they first published these findings, a lot of um, other comparative psychologists were skeptical and said, well, now... Let's not get into this thinking that monkeys have words for things, okay? That's too complex for a species. I'm sure that it's just the monkey happens to, to send out a certain call, and then the monkeys look to, the other monkeys look to that monkey and do whatever he's doing. So if a monkey sees an eagle, he'll let out an alarm call, call and then he'll run down the tree. All the other monkeys see him running down the tree, and they just follow suit, okay? So the experimenter said, fine, we'll do an experiment. Okay, so they did what's called a playback experiment, and they just played the calls out. So there was no, you know, control monkey that was performing the original behavior. It's a tape recorder, okay? So they played a recording of a snake alarm call, and sure enough, all the monkeys in the area stood up and looked for the snake, okay? You play a leopard alarm call, call all the monkeys run up into the trees, okay? There's no monkey to look for to model your behavior after. You're literally just responding to the sound, okay? So this showed, oh wow, these monkeys have what we could call words for different predators, okay? I mean, they're not speaking an actual word, but each alarm call has a semantic meaning to it, okay? So this is a very complex communication that we find um, in a species that generally, again, we wouldn't, you know, give a second thought to, like, it's a monkey, it can't be that intelligent, okay? So we see language in other animals. It's certainly not as complex as us. They're not going to write the next great American novel, okay? but we do see that they have meaning behind their calls that they have, okay? All right, and then the last main topic before I go more into just comparative psychology and some of the issues that we have within it is this idea of self-awareness, okay? And anybody that has a pet and knows I'm a comparative psychologist wants to come to me and ask me questions about their animal, which is fine because I like talking about animals way more than I like talking about people, okay? But this question is, does my dog or does my cat or my parrot or whatever know that it's an individual? Does he really know that he exists, okay? We know, does he sit at home thinking all day, what should I do today? Okay, because we like to think that our animals do that. All right, so the idea of self-awareness is does an animal know that it's an actual individual, okay? And it's really hard to come up with a way to study this, right? We can't ask the animal, okay, do you, do you sit around and think about philosophy all day? Do you wonder about the world and your place in it, okay? The animal cannot communicate with us. So the best way that we have come up with to figure out this idea of self-awareness is to do what's called a mirror self-recognition test, or MSR. 
okay? And we actually test this in children, okay? If you've ever had a young child, okay, the first time they see the mirror, they like wave at it or they try to talk to it or they walk around the mirror to figure out where the other child is, okay? Right away, as humans even, we don't recognize that that image, that our reflection, is us, right? It takes us a while to figure out, oh, when I, when I wave, the other thing is waving. That's me, <laughs> okay? It takes children a couple of years to figure this out, okay? And so we've studied this extensively in children, and what we do with children is called a mark test, okay? So the idea here is that you, you know, you have put the child in front of the mirror, they look at it, and then you distract them, and you take a marker, and you put a little mark on their cheek. Okay, and then they look back at the mirror, and if they know that it's themselves, they'll see this mark on their cheek, and they'll touch their own cheek. They'll investigate, okay, self-exploration. Oh, that, I know this is me, and now there's a mark on my cheek, and so they touch it, and they're like, what is that, okay? If they don't do anything with it, they don't recognize that it's themselves, okay? And so we determine in children when they have self-recognition at the point where they pass the mark test. It's not a perfect test, but it's what we've come up with, okay? And so this is now how we test it in other species. Okay, now as far as dogs, dogs don't pass the mark test, okay? Now you ask yourself, how does a dog touch its cheek, okay? Well, it can't, okay? So in species that can't actually touch themselves, we measure it in looking time, okay? Usually if an animal has this self-recognition, it will stare at itself longer when it has a mark on its cheek than if it doesn't, okay? Dogs don't stare at themselves significantly longer than whether or not they have a mark on their cheek, okay? Growing up, my Border Collie, we couldn't have any mirrors at her level because she would just attack it, okay? Mm -hmm. she was, I mean, she never learned that it's you, <laughs> okay? Um, so dogs do not pass the self-recognition test. Um, chimpanzees do. This is a chimpanzee. Um, you can actually see once they figure out that it's their reflection, they'll examine their teeth, they'll groom themselves. I mean, they really have this idea that this is me, and they use the mirror to, to take care of themselves. So chimpanzees love mirrors. Um, they're growing up, when they're first exposed, they're just like human children. Um, they don't understand it. There's videos that you can find on YouTube of little chimpanzees like getting all fluffed up and hopping around and burying their teeth because they think it's another baby chimp. All right, um, elephants pass the mark test, okay? They actually touch the mark with their trunk, okay? And so they're very aware of that. You can actually see in this picture, there's a little, um, little X on the mirror image there. There's a little X on his head, so they've actually probably put like tape or something like that. Um, and that elephant has gone into the mirror and it will touch it and it'll look at it, what's on my head type of thing, okay? Um, corvids, uh, different types of ravens, different species of ravens that we call corvids, they pass, pass the mark test, okay? Um, again, they can't touch anything, but they stare at their reflection significantly longer than when there's no mark on them. And they'll kind of posture in front of it and they're very curious about this mark that they now have on their body. Okay. Now dolphins, this is a very big controversy. Okay. The people that have done, the researchers that have done the research on the mirror self-recognition in dolphins, they've published their findings and said this absolutely proves that dolphins have self-recognition because they spend significantly more time in front of the mirror. They mark their sides okay, instead of their face. Um, and the dolphins will sit there and they'll look at their side in the mirror. But other psychologists who have gotten the video and have looked at the findings, they look at that and say, you can't tell that that dolphin's actually looking at the mirror. You know, it's hard when your eyes are on the side of your head, okay? They say, no, you can't really tell um, if they're spending significantly more time. This is a very heated debate. When you go to animal conferences, I mean, they, they get nasty with each other over, over dolphin self-recognition, okay? This is a very, very heated debate, okay? So I've put a question mark here. It really depends on who you talk to, okay? I, I mean, from my personal studies, I would say dolphins are definitely smart enough. I think we need a better test, okay? You know, mere self-recognition is great for children and animals that can touch themselves, but again, going back to just looking at, if we look at the horses, you have to have the appropriate test. You have to have the appropriate stimuli. So it'd be great if for every species we could use the same test, but it just might not be salient for every species. So we have to come up with a better test other than MSR, okay? I don't know what that could be. No one's figured it out yet, but I'm sure some genius will come up with it and then I'll be back in a few years and I can explain it to you. All right. So we've talked you know, about kind of conservation, this idea of animal welfare, about curiosity, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this whole idea of comparing humans to animals. What makes us human? All right? So, you know, is it an accurate comparison? Especially if you're looking at medical research, you say, okay, well, we're using this mouse to study Alzheimer's disease. Okay, well, 
How does, it, how does a mouse relate to Alzheimer's disease? Can you really take a mouse brain, which has very little complexity compared to the human brain, and try to cure Alzheimer's from it? Okay? So really, is this an accurate comparison that we can make? Okay? So there are some problems with this idea. So first of all, when you're comparing animals to humans, the main source for all of our cognitive and behavioral studies come from captive animals. Okay? Here's some problems with having animals in captivity. Okay? First of all, behavior is a result of experience. And when you take an animal out of its natural environment and put it in a captive environment, okay, even if it's a nice zoo with lots of enrichment and stuff, it's not the same as that natural environment because that animal is not free to roam wherever it is. It doesn't have to worry about predators. It doesn't have to catch prey. Okay? So now all of a sudden you've probably decreased the cognitive abilities of that animal because growing up, it was, you know, if you're looking at a, a tiger, let's say, in a zoo, it gets dead meat tossed to it. It has no natural predators. It doesn't have to worry about finding a mate. It literally has nothing to do, <laughs> okay? So why, as a tiger, should my brain be very complex like it is in the wild? I have nothing to do, okay? So the early environment affects brain development. So if you're studying tigers in captivity or anything in captivity and trying to say that this correlates to animals in the wild or somehow correlates to humans, you're going to have an issue, okay? Because you cannot guarantee that that brain complexity is the same as it would be naturally, all right? Um, also, social animals that are raised in isolation are not going to behave normally, okay? When you have a monkey in captivity, that normally lives in like huge troops of 40 or 50 animals and it's got maybe like two playmates, you're going to have differences in behavior. It's going to behave abnormally because it's used to a very complex social environment and now you've put it in essentially a deprived social environment. Okay? So you cannot say that that is behaving the same way it would naturally. Okay? And then, you know, when it all boils down, we as humans, as researchers, we still don't know all of the factors within the environment that influence behavior and cognition, okay? We're still learning. We're still, we're still figuring everything out, okay? So we try to make our best guess, but we don't know for sure. So when you're seeing all these publications and all this research done on, you know, humans are so much smarter than animals because we can do this and they can't, keep in mind, we're studying captive animals, okay? This is not necessarily how intelligent these animals would be in the wild, okay? Now, most of our comparisons that we do in comparative psychology when we're looking at really how truly intelligent humans are, we like to compare it to chimpanzees, okay? Why? Well, they're our closest genetic relative, okay? So if we're looking at the evolutionary branches, chimpanzees are our closest relative. We have the most common recent ancestor with them, okay? But we've got some problems with the study of chimpanzees, okay? And the first one kind of goes back to this idea of captivity. When you're studying humans, okay? Humans, when you bring them into the psychological laboratory, they're mostly volunteers. They're selected from their free-ranging environment, okay? Our chimpanzees that we have in captivity that we do experiments on, they're in deprived social environments, okay? They've been, you know, either whether they're from, they were born in captivity or they were rescued from, you know, the black market or whatever it might be, they're in a deprived social environment. And we are comparing them to humans that have had time to live in a nice full social environment, okay? The other thing to keep in mind anytime you read a psychological study, it doesn't necessarily represent everyone in the world, okay? 90% of our psychological research is done on white, middle-class Westerners, okay? Because that's the easiest demographic to get, okay? You know, researchers don't have the funding to go to Kenya and study cultures in Kenya or Zimbabwe or even New Zealand, okay? We have a lot of freshmen <laughs> in universities that have to take, that have to ex participate in experimental research to pass general psychology, okay? <laughs> Really easy to get that research, but it's definitely biased what we know about humans, okay? Everything is about white, middle-class Westerners because that's the easiest demographic to get. All right, so keep that in mind and we'll come back to that. Now, human subjects are tested with conspecifics. A conspecific is a member of your species. So when you're looking at social interactions between two humans, okay, well, we study social interactions between two humans, okay? Then we bring a chimpanzee into the lab and we ask it to interact with a human, and we compare that interaction, okay? Not the same thing, okay? If you were looking at two chimpanzees interacting, then we could look at a social interaction. But asking a chimpanzee to interact with a human and then compare that to a human interacting with a human, it's not the same thing, okay? I mean, it almost seems ridiculous that you would think that's okay, okay? Um, human subjects are usually tested in the same room as the experimenters, right? Usually you don't need to put a glass barrier between your human, your human participants, okay? 
Chimpanzees, not that way. There's usually some kind of barrier, and that's to protect the experimenter. You're dealing with a, with a wild animal, okay? Chimpanzees are very unpredictable. They will rip your face off if they get frustrated, okay? Um, so, again, nothing where you can really do about that. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just something to keep in mind that that is a difference when you're studying social interactions or the ability to solve a problem. All right, um, fourth difference. We like to study the differences between chimpanzee infants and human infants, okay? When you bring a human infant into the psychological laboratory, parent sits there with it. Gets to sit on the parent's lap, it has the comfort of the parent, okay? The baby chimpanzee is taken away from the parent completely, okay? It's put in an isolated room, there's a bunch of humans in there that it's not familiar with, and they're asking it to solve problems or look at itself in the mirror. Of course that's going to be scary for the baby chimpanzee. Of course he's not going to perform to the level he might be capable of if he had the comfort of his mother and there weren't strangers around. All right? And then the last thing is that human subjects are tested with human objects, okay, and human puzzles, and so are chimpanzees, okay? Um, oh, when it, going back to this number two here, when we're talking about human subjects being tested with conspecifics, there was an interesting study that was done about pointing. This idea of social referencing, okay? When I point to somewhere, you automatically, it's within your brain, you want to follow where I'm pointing to. Same if I gaze. If I gaze over somewhere, everybody automatically thinks, what's she looking at, okay? And you gaze over with us, okay? Dogs do this. Dogs are domesticated, and they are very good at wanting to attend to whatever their owners are looking at, okay? So when you point and say, look at that over there, the dog automatically says, what? Is it exciting? <laughs> okay? And they want to know what's going on. So this idea of social referencing has become a really big idea of looking what other species can do this. Is this a truly you know, human thing and domesticated animal thing or can our closest you know, cousins, the chimpanzees, do this as well? So they set up an experiment where they bring the chimpanzee into the room and the human sits in the middle, okay, and there's two objects on either side and the human points to the object. Okay? And the idea is the chimpanzee should wonder, oh, well, what's it pointing at? Is there food under the bucket? You know, what, what should I go investigate? Okay? And they did this multiple times, and the chimpanzee did nothing. It didn't care what was under the bucket. It didn't follow the, the pointer um, either with their hand or when they gazed at it. And they said, well, look, chimpanzees don't have social referencing. This is amazing. This must be something truly human that we evolved and developed after we split off from chimpanzees. All right, well, another group of scientists thought, I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that it's a human doing the pointing. So they trained a chimpanzee to point, okay? And instead of the human sitting here, they trained a chimpanzee to sit and to point at one of the objects, brought the other chimpanzee in. As soon as that model chimpanzee pointed, the other chimp said, ooh, what's under there, okay? The chimpanzee might have something interesting to say, okay? If a human is pointing, the chimpanzee says, what, you're a human. What could you possibly have that's interesting? Okay, I, I don't care what you're pointing at or what you're gazing at. When another chimpanzee was doing it, now it becomes interesting. Okay, so again, yes, they have social referencing, but you have to do the proper test. Okay, um, so again, if we're looking at, you know, human subjects get to use human toys, you give a baby chimpanzee some Legos or some blocks, and then you want it to build something. And you say, well, look, a, a human two-year-old will build a little castle out of blocks or whatever, and this chimpanzee can't do it. It's not that it can't. Maybe it doesn't want to, okay? Maybe it just doesn't care about blocks. It's not relevant to the chimpanzee, okay? He can't eat it. He can't do anything with it, okay? They have their own types of play that humans don't, okay? So we make all these comparisons to what we can do and what chimpanzees can't do, and you have to remember, maybe it's just that they don't want to, okay? Maybe they just don't care about this human experiment that they are being forced to participate in. All right, so anytime you read a study where it's comparing chimpanzees and humans, you have to remember that you're actually comparing white, middle-class, Western humans to captive chimpanzees, and that is an essential difference, okay? And so until we have really established our cross-cultural psychology and we're incorporating all different types of cultures into studying human psychology, and until we can really start to figure out how to study chimpanzees in the wild better and learn about wild cognitive abilities, you cannot make the comparison because there are too many differences. All right, so future of comparative psychology, some key challenges. Um, researchers have to keep in mind those four main questions. We've got Tinbergen's four questions that we had talked about. Okay, you have to be aware that every behavior you're looking at has different explanations to, that can be had for it, and you have to keep all of four of those in mind. 
All right? Um, you have to look for alternate perspectives, okay? It's important that we don't overcomplex certain behaviors, okay? You can't just say, oh, look, that animal's doing this. I bet there's this huge complex behavior to it because sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct explanation, okay? But at the same time, we don't want to oversimplify things. And if the animal fails a test the first time, first look and see if it's your test that is wrong, okay? Because a lot of times it's just the human researcher is behaving stupidly, not the animal, okay? Um, and then finally, if there's controversy in the field, we can't see that as a hurdle, okay? We can't see it as, well, now we just have to stop everything. If people are disagreeing, then we need to come up with a different test. If mere self-recognition is creating huge controversy in the field, awesome. Let's figure out another test that will make everybody happy. Well, nothing will ever make everybody happy, but make more people happy. All right, so just some key challenges for the future as it continues. Um, and th these are some excellent papers. If you are interested in any of the studies, you can reference these. And now I will take questions. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, excellent talk. Very oh, thank cool. you. Very conservative. <laughs> uh, what's your research today? What are you doing? Um, right now, I'm mostly focused on teaching. I'm trying to get some uh, students involved in possibly continuing my equine personality research. Um, so my dissertation basically w was starting out to look at horse personality, and I wanted to look at cognitive abilities and how that compares to personality. Um, and then when I started to do research into the field and look at the literature, I found that so far, all animal personality, and especially horse personality, was judged based on the human personality tests, okay? Meaning literally on these surveys of horse personality, they were asking, does your horse think about the social world? Does your horse like poetry? That's literally a question. Does your horse like poetry, okay? And this is all the published research of that. So I basically did my entire dissertation to disprove that that test was accurate, okay, or in any way valid. Um, and so now that I've done that, I would like to actually create a personality test for horses that is valid and then go from there and compare cognitive abilities to personality type. So that's kind of my five-year plan. <laughs> yes? So what are our cats and dogs really thinking? <laughs> you know, dogs I'm not sure about. I'm more of a cat person. Um, and most of the time, I'm pretty sure your cat is thinking that you're stupid. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, it really it depends on cats. I don't know what they're really thinking. But I, I do have a lot of research that I've been doing, um, you know, almost anecdotally more on cats and um, their behavior. So I can answer more of that at lunchtime because I could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> yes? The term instinct has never appeared in your mm -hmm. discussion. Is it an obsolete dinosaur term? No, no. Instinct is definitely something that occurs in almost all animals. Um, you know, I, brief I had briefly mentioned with the bird song, when a young songbird is bored, it instinctively will sing. It will make noise, okay? If you deprive him of access to a, an established song from an adult bird, it will never develop that species song. It will just kind of what we call babble. It, it'd be like a human infant that's never exposed to grammar or actual language. It will just babble and coo all the, all the time, even into adulthood. So instinct definitely exists. It exists with the imprinting, like the ducklings that are hatched, and they instinctively imprint on the first living thing that it sees. Um, so no, we definitely do a lot of studies with instinct still in comparative psychology, absolutely. <laughs> My pocket. <laughs> no, um, there's, it's hard to get funding, um, and, and right now where I am, um, there's no available funding. But you know, hopefully in the future, um, I'll come up with some brilliant idea. Maybe I'll come up with a new self-awareness test, and then somebody will give me money. <laughs> That'll be nice. <laughs> yeah. What's one of the biggest controversies in this field right now? Hmm. Um, you know, it used to be the whole idea of nature versus nurture. Uh, now pretty much everyone is in agreement that it's nature and nurture. It's 50-50. You know, you, can, you have your genes, and genes are very important, but it's also the environment plays a huge part in that. Um, so now, I mean, the biggest controversy probably lays within um, the experimentation of what animals can and cannot do. You know, when I go to the big conferences um, of comparative cognition, there's one every year down in Florida that I try to go to, um, and the whole idea is, you know, we look at rats and pigeons and all these different things and we say, look at the abilities they have, and then you always have the skeptic that says, mm, I bet you did that wrong. I bet that you're just misinterpreting that. So probably the biggest controversy is, is what the animals can actually do, um, because everybody is always a skeptic, which is good. Skepticism is very healthy for the field of science. We absolutely need that. Um, otherwise, you get findings published that are completely inaccurate. Um, but that's probably the biggest controversy. How long does it take to teach a horse to do 
those uh, recognition? Um, for the concept learning, like the two task, probably not very long. You could probably do it if you did like sessions every day, a couple sessions every day, they could get it down within two weeks. Um, the categorization, I'm thinking probably one to two months. And you have such differences in horses too. Um, and what they find with most species is that they have this ability of learning to learn. So basically once a horse has figured out, ah, I'm part of these experiments and I've learned what a concept is, every time you train it in a new task or give it a new concept or a new category to learn, it learns it faster every single time. Because once it's figured out what the human wants it to do, then it becomes very simple for the horse. So with these horses that we call them um, experimentally sound as opposed to experimentally naive, meaning they've never done an experiment, these horses that have been at the Equine Research Center doing these experiments for years and years, they can learn these new tasks in like days. So if you're taking the horse out of your barn that has never participated in an experiment and you're like, I'm going to teach my horse categorization, okay? <laughs> it's going to take you a while, okay? Because this horse has no idea what you want it to do. So that, that first experiment might take you up to six months before the horse finally catches on that what you <laughs> want it to do. Once it's figured that out though, every new experiment, it will learn quicker and quicker. So then how long is a session? It, it varies on the animal because if the animal gets bored very quickly or it gets full from the treats, I mean, it might only last <laughs> five or 15 minutes, okay? Um, so, it, and some horses are really eager to learn and they think the experiments are fun and they might go for half an hour, 45 minutes. So, it really is going to depend on the individual animal. Yeah. Well, so, Rachel, do you think that there's a varying levels of intelligence with the oh, animals? Oh, yeah. Definitely, and that's why, you know, with my dissertation, I was interested in looking at that personality with the cognitive ability because it, I don't think necessarily some horses are dumber than others. I think some of them just won't care that the human wants them to participate in the experiment as much, you know, because, you know, if you've got a very stubborn horse that is like, I don't care about your carrots or whatever you're trying to feed me, I don't want to participate, it's not necessarily going to mean that they're not intelligent. It's going to be based on their personality, and so that's kind of what I had wanted to investigate and what I will do in the future. It seems sort of odd that you're using the word personality with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you define uh, the character guess, right. of the horse? Well, and that's why, you know, when I had started looking at doing animal personality, because this is a new upcoming thing. Animal personality is extremely interesting. There's been lots of species being studied with this. And I started doing research on this, and I found, oh, they just used the human personality test, and they gave it to the horse, host, horse owners and said, fill out this personality survey on your horse. And it had questions of, does your horse like poetry? And, you know, does your horse like to be around other horses? And when I, ha I had people fill out the survey, and I got all these emails back from Wyoming people like, oh, honey, you obviously. <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, no, I do. I do. I'm trying to prove that this is a dumb survey. <laughs> so just bear with me and fill out the dumb survey so that I can prove that this is not how to measure horse personality. Um, and then the idea is to make a better survey is that you would actually get horse people involved, people that are familiar with horses, and you would do what we call behaviorally defined adjectives, okay? And you come up with adjectives like stubborn and intelligent and hardworking, and you define them out, and you ask people to say, okay, is this a good adjective to describe a horse, okay? And then you come up with a list of those adjectives, and then you make a survey from that to try to figure out what dimensions of personality a horse has, okay? But up until now, we've just used that human survey, and it's kind of ridiculous, actually. <laughs> Yes. Uh, have you figured out how easy it is for animals to train people? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> you know, my fa when we're comparing dolphins, there's a little um, image on Facebook that says, like, dolphins are so smart, they've trained humans to give them fish every time they jump out of a pool. Um, but it is. I mean, humans de or animals definitely, they're very good at, at, especially our pets, at figuring out how to get humans to respond to them. Um, you know, my dogs know that if they give me the puppy dog look, I'm going to give them a milk bone. Like, there's just, I'm like, oh, you're so cute. And so they, they know, you know, that they can positively reinforce us by looking at us a certain way and doing that. So, um, I don't know of any scientific research where they looked at actual, because no human wants to admit that the animal will actually train them, right? <laughs> no, no comparative researcher is going to publish saying, the monkey trained me to do this. So, <laughs> no one's going to publish that. We'll have to come back okay. to talk in the Thank future. you very much. To access all of our Saturday U lectures and to find out about upcoming Saturday U events in your area, visit uwyo.edu slash Saturday U.